Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the channel. It is 6.23 a.m. East Coast time, Tuesday, September 10th. And today I'm going to take an early look, position by position, the players that interest me, either a yes, a maybe with an X on the screen, or an N. No, we're going to go position by position. This video is probably going to come in around a half an hour, but I thank you for being here Tuesday. It's early in the week. Monday Night Football just ended. I have a first look video already out, something fun just to look at. But now after reviewing PFF, Next Gen Stats, um, pro football focus uh, uh, or pro football, football reference, all these things, a bunch of stats databases trying to see really what happened week one that we couldn't catch by obviously not watching all 16 games and not being able to kind of keep an eye on every single thing on the line of scrimmage and whatnot. So excited to kind of break it down early, right? Still, there's going to be a lot of players in these player pools of mine and then come Friday, I'll do my final thoughts video that was wildly popular, 7,000 views, by far the most I've ever gotten. Thank you all so much. Uh, if you're new to this channel, which a lot of people during the NFL season are finding me now, channel is growing rapidly, approaching 8,000 subscribers. Thank you all so much. I cover daily fantasy sports in NFL, NBA, MLB, and the WNBA. So I appreciate it. I will be live today and Thursday at 11 a.m. on Awesomeo's channel with Lofi and Saturday at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. with Chris Randone chatting about this NFL, this week two slate. Uh, so let's get into it. If you can hit the subscribe button before we do, if you get any value, if you're new here and you don't want to hit it yet, if you get any value from this video, please hit that button. And then also down below, I do have exclusive content on Patreon, uh, Patreon exclusive live streams, where I only go live over there. I have a video that breaks down leverage and ownership for the week in terms of where I'm getting away from the chalk, who I'm eating at chalk. That is only for Patreon. That's a podcast on Fridays. All of my stat sheets, all of my tiers and rankings, my game by game notes, my recap notes from the week before in terms of opportunities touches and carries uh, and more things that i'm forgetting that's all on patreon as well as my nfl daily fantasy courses linked down below so there's all the housekeeping let's just get into it we'll go position by position i'll let you know where i am on tuesday right so when you come back on thursday and you say ah you didn't touch on this well it's tuesday maybe some things from the injury reports did not come out yet we will follow all that up on friday's final thoughts video i'll have a thursday night video tomorrow i'll be live before the game starts on thursday around six o'clock and a couple more videos will be out during the week so so my, my yeses, and these are in no ranking order. They're just the way that uh, Google Sheets uh, filtered it. Um, so my yeses, and I'll start with the one who's the most interesting to me is Josh Allen. Um, he got into my cash game lineup, actually, and there's a lot to like here. Uh, he had 10 rush attempts last week, which obviously, if you follow me, you know I love quarterbacks that have rushing upside, but not just rushing upside. Rushing upside is very good for DraftKings, for, um, for overall fantasy format, obviously more points on the ground, easier to get them. But 10 rushing attempts was twice as many as any other quarterback. Jameis Winston had five rushing attempts. Uh, Josh Allen had 10. He ran in a touchdown. He had a couple of red zone carries. I mean, this guy is not only going to throw the ball deep, but he's also going to run whenever the heck he wants. It's insane to watch this guy run that offense. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, but Josh Allen, he lives on pretty much John Brown played really well, right? Uh, he had nine targets, seven catches, 123 yards and a touchdown. His new number one weapon, you can say out there. Uh, and the offense actually looked really good. And Josh Allen, if he has time to throw, he's going to throw deep. And John Brown is one of the best in the entire league, similar to, um, he's a burner, similar to being in the league for a while, Deshaun Jackson, at just getting open deep when you give him time. Uh, last week, the New York Giants graded dead last in pass rush. Dead last. So you know what that's going to equal? It's going to equal Josh Allen being able to, one, scramble more, right? Dead last in pass rush. No pressure on him. Dead last in pressure rates per pro football focus. It's going to allow Josh Allen to scramble more, which is going to allow more rushing attempts, which is obviously better for fantasy points. But then it's also going to allow more time to just uh, let your receivers get deep in their progressions, which means I, I wrote down a dot in down average depth of target is going to go way up. Uh, John Brown's going to have his deep target. So once again, this week against a team that just got shredded by Dallas, Dak threw for over 400 yards, four touchdowns. They look just abysmal. Like Gen uh, Janoris Jenkins is like the only talent, I guess you can even say, but he's kind of falling rapidly uh, down his peak on that defense right now. So in my opinion, so yeah, uh, Josh Allen stands out at 5,300 as a, a, a great play for even cash, a great play for GPPs with that price point. It's really hard to get away from in my opinion. $5,900 Jared Goff. Um, I really like Jared Goff this week. His wide receivers were balling out on, um, on Sunday. Robert Woods, 13 targets. Cooper Cup, 10 targets. Both of them were in the top 10 for wide receivers in separation. Uh, and then you get Jared Goff coming in here who had the highest uh, difference between his expected completion percentage and his completion percentage. It was 10%. The next closest was, I believe, Jameis at 6%. So what does that mean? Well, expected completion percentage is in a neutral situation with a neutral quarterback, how many of those passes were expected to be completed um, based on just quarterback average, based on his skill set. He completed less than 10%. So what does that mean? Well, uh, that means he got unlucky. That means he was playing um, to sort of his bottom or his floor. If he just plays average, he'll be 10% higher in completion percentage, which means that 
three of those incompletions to Cooper Cup might be caught, some of them, which means that Robert Woods, uh, his his like four or five incompletions to him might be caught. The deep ball to Brandon Cooks that was overthrown twice might be um, caught. So yeah, I'm really high on Jared Goff for week two. I think a lot of people will be off of him. They were already off of him. Now he's 5,900. Price point doesn't really change if at all and now he gets to go up against the Saints who Deshaun Watson just had his way against albeit Sean or albeit DeAndre Hopkins was balling out but um, just in general Kenny Stills got open caught a touchdown we saw Will Fuller have um, a successful game so yeah I really like this Rams offense this week against the Saints I imagine a lot of people though the problem is are going to jump on that uh, because last year we saw a very high scoring game and people are going to see the total of this game which is I've yet yet to see one but they're going to see the total and it's probably going to be in the 50s or mid 50s and uh, going to garner a lot of attention but yeah 50 nine hundred dollar Jared Goff he, he's due for already regression after a week one poor performance Dak Prescott it's hard not to like him uh we talked about the Giants being dead last in the pass rush last week against Dak Prescott well Washington last week was second to last Washington against the Eagles last week we saw Carson Wentz have a clean pocket for pretty much the entire second half and really uh, the third quarter on second worst in pass rush week one or they just have no pressure on the quarterback now they're starting defensive tackle is out that's going to help Deke Deke, Deke and Zach that's that's Dak and Zeke put together but uh, it's going to help Dak it's going to help Zeke we saw this offense under Kellen Moore really flourish week one $6,300 the price point did not rebound enough I have interest uh, Tom Brady and then Jimmy Garoppolo are my final yeses for this week Tom Brady against Miami um, I mean last week Miami got torn up in the air off of the play action pass attempts um, from Lamar Jackson uh, they ran the, fifth, the fourth most or the top four in play action pass attempts week one was Baltimore and it just absolutely burned this Miami team. Half of the defense wants to wants to a trade. That's not a joke. Half seven players called up, half of them on defense, and said we want to be traded. We think the organization is trying to lose. So none of those guys have motivation. It was pretty obvious when Hollywood Brown. Yes, he's fast, but nobody was even around him. As in, like, okay, yeah, you just do your thing. We don't really care about this game. Uh, so motivation is a clear issue there. Now you have Tom Brady coming in with a full arsenal of weapons. This wide receiver depth went from really bad to really good really quick uh, before the Josh Gordon incident. It was really just Julian Edelman, Philip Dorsett, Jacoby Myers, and like Braxton and Berrios, like and uh, an injured and bummy old Demarius Thomas. Like that's bad. Now you're upgrading to, uh, in literally like a month, you're upgrading to Josh Gordon, Antonio Brown, and Julian Edelman as your top three wide receivers. Uh, that's absolutely insane. Uh, yeah, so full arsenal of weapons. Still going to have Rex Burkhead, who looked fine out of the backfield, catching ball. Similar things can be said about James White as well. Jimmy G against Cincinnati, he looked okay, like nothing fantastic here. He's going to really struggle from, I would say, a lack of, not even a lack of talent. There's talent around him, but just like maturity. So George Kittle was targeted 10 times, caught eight balls for like 54 yards. He looked fine. Like I'm not worried about the Jimmy G, uh, George Kittle connection. Debo Samuel, the rookie wide receiver, actually led the entire team in terms of rookies and snaps at 88%. Dante Pettis, a guy who has a lot of talent, a guy who was good last year, but really fell this training camp in preseason, um, was getting uh, just absolutely bragged on by his head coach Shanahan and some people were saying ah he's just being hard some people were saying no there's logic to this I was saying yes I think there's merit to this only saw two snaps last week I think one target so yeah two snaps is not great um so your opportunities are not great so a playmaker off the field uh, Jalen Hurd is still injured here so really it's just um George Kittle your Tevin Coleman's out uh, is going to be out from the backfield. You, um, in terms of being injured, Matt Breida should be catching more balls. So Jimmy G is going to have opportunities around him. Out of all these guys who are yeses, out of all five, he's probably the one I have the least interest in, closer to an X, which is just sort of some interest right now. I need to find more to get into it. Obviously, the Bengals are a team that is nice to target. Uh, we saw Russell Wilson have an okay to good game against him last week. Uh, I believe he threw two touchdowns, one to Lockett uh, and one to Chris Carson. And then you had just overall, their defense has not improved. Um, I mean, when Andy Dalton throws 50 plus times, there's probably a reason why. And it's probably because the team on the other end is putting up points. Uh, we'll just briefly touch on some of the maybes that stand out to me. Um, uh, Derek Carr is a maybe that stands out because he actually has weapons even with no AB. Like Darren Waller, a tight end from Baltimore, was drafted, been out of the league a couple of years now, drafted in like 2015, 2014. Um, he had seven catches on eight targets for 70 yards. We saw Tyrell Williams get loose over 100 yards in a touchdown. Hunter Renfro in the slot was on the field a ton. Josh Jacobs played really well, had two touchdowns on the ground. So this offense overall is going to be able to move the ball. They're going to be able to face the Chiefs, whose defense is clearly just absolutely abysmal. Um, so I have a lot of interest. I mean, we saw Jacksonville have success last week against the Chiefs with Gardner Minshaw, 
Yes, Gardner Minshaw, we can say what we want about him. He was good in the preseason to an extent, but still, he's Gardner Minshaw, and he had a lot of success. That's because he was facing Kansas City's defense. I don't think we would be saying Gardner Minshaw looked good if he was facing Buffalo or Detroit or the Bears, right? So a good matchup for Derek Carr here. No rushing upside, which is worrisome, which is why I get to guys like Dak. I get to guys like uh, Josh Allen before him by far. Uh, But Derek Carr stands out as somebody who actually has some talent around him, and is going to be in a very good matchup with a game script that probably says throw the ball most of the second half. Um, and that's really it I'll touch on for now. Drew Brees is fine at 6,200 in his matchup against the Rams. That's going to be an overall shootout, but I'd rather have the Jared Goff side of it. Let's get to running backs. Let's not break that down too much. So you're going to see me have a lot of running backs and a lot of wide receivers listed. Well, that's because it's Tuesday and I'm analyzing things and I'm trying to really break it apart. If you watched my video last Tuesday, you would notice the same thing. Then come Friday, everything's like cut in half. Um, so yeah. I mean, the guys who are $8,000 or above, they have to have interest. They're absolutely elite. Alvin Kamara played more snaps than he did the final half of last year when everybody was like, oh, like Alvin Kamara, when he was playing 60% of the snaps last year, was still balling out, even with Mark Ingram having a good share. Last night, he played 76% of the running back snaps. He saw 70% of the running back targets. Um, A lot of the goal line work and overall in the red zone, Latavius Murray's touchdown was from 30 yards out on his uh, sort of spell there. So Kamara's fine, $8,200. Again, this game overall looks really nice. Him and Michael Thomas are the obvious run it back in a stack with a stack of Jared Goff, uh, Cooper Cup, Brandon Cooks, or Robert, whatever two wide receivers you want to pair with, um, whatever two wide receivers you want to pair with Jared Goff, running it back with Alvin Kamara and or Michael Thomas makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott against Washington, again, uh, they were just absolutely terrible in run D last week. They were second worst, only behind Dallas, actually, uh, in rushing D for PFF grades. Dallas was actually really bad last week, but again, a very limited sample to actually do anything. Saquon had like 11 carries for over 100 yards, um, and and he looked great. Like a 59-yard run, but Dallas graded out really poorly on Rundy, um, and so did Washington. Second worst, now they're without a defensive tackle, 8,700. He played 31 snaps last week, Zeke. I imagine he goes to a full workload this week. The only issue here is that Tony Pollard is talented. They probably want to get him in to this offense, I imagine Tony Pollard is going to continue to see five to eight touches a game, which is like five to eight that Zeke will not see, which is a little bit worrisome, but Zeke should still see 20 plus. David Johnson lined up as a wide receiver 15 times per PFF week one. You know how many times he lined up as a wide receiver last year? 16 times. Yeah, so David Johnson is clearly going to be used in much more effective ways. He lined up in the slot a ton, out wide, 15 times total in week one. That's fantastic. He had a very good week one. The only problem here, he's 7,100 and he's facing Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore is not the team that you really want to target players against. But if a running back is 7,100 and they're going to be utilized in the way that David Johnson is with his skill set, he would be one of the guys that I would actually target against Baltimore. Now, there's so many more options on the slate that I don't know if I actually end up getting there. Probably definitely not in cash, uh, but it's a very good tournament spot for sure. Chris Carson, $6,400. Chris Carson was absolutely incredible week one. He led the team in carries. He led the team in targets, seven targets. He had like a 37.5% target share. All the hype on him seeing more looks um, as a pass catcher came true. It was like one one of the only coach speak things to come true. So I like Chris Carson. Again, led the team in targets and rushes. Had two touchdowns week one. Look, he's facing Pittsburgh. Um, 6,400 on the road. It's not a great matchup by any means, but if you're telling me that his he's going to be seeing like six to eight targets a week now as a running back, um, that increases his floor quite a bit and his ceiling and his median. Everything gets increases there. Um, a rising tide lifts all boats. So $6,400 for Carson. Yes, the matchup is not fantastic. I don't think it's needed like it was last week when he was 5,700 in a fantastic spot against the Bengals, but it's still very, very good. Austin Eckler, 6,100. Price doesn't come up enough here. He had 70% of the workload the last week. The Colts defense looked very, very bad. Um, The Colts defense looked very, very bad last week against him. He made them look very bad. He was second in points per snap. Uh, Second in points per snap at 0.84 points per snap that he played. Um, He played 70% of the snaps. I imagine that number really only increases after how well he played week one. I feel bad for Melvin Gordon. The only interest here in terms of like, he's bad, like he's not a good running back, Melvin Gordon, compared to Zeke and Le'Veon Bell. He's not in that tier. So him trying to hold out in a situation is not that great when Austin Eckler goes for three touchdowns and just balls out and wins you the game pretty much. Uh, Detroit, the only worry here is that they play slower, similar to their pace last year. They actually played up, but a lot of that was because they were playing Arizona last week, who uh, actually played at the highest pace for week one. Um, so if Detroit goes back to what they knew, normally want to do and not throw for 300 yards and three touchdowns and run the ball more, that could be a concern overall for the amount of touches that Eckler gets, but he's so effective on points per snap that he doesn't have to get a ton of snaps. Um, so Eckler at 6,100 is still way too cheap. Mark Ingram, $6,000. I love it. Uh, Baltimore running backs had 14 red zone targets in week one or red zone carries in week one. Justice Hill, rookie, had two. Mark Ingram had 
five and Gus Edwards had seven. Now don't read into the splits there because Mark Ingram left the game with like a quarter and like over a quarter left. He would have seen a lot more red zone touches. He would have led this team in red zone touches. The point being they're playing Arizona who just gave up so many points in overall yardage to the Detroit Lions who don't seem to be a very um, elite team on offense to be honest with you. And now you get Mark Ingram who's going to touch the ball a ton. Baltimore will run probably the second or most snaps this week right there with Arizona. This game is going to have a lot of plays. Arizona wants to play fast, lots of plays there. Baltimore is going to run a lot of plays. They play relatively fast, but they also get a lot of plays off because they're very efficient in terms of how many plays per drive that they have. Efficient actually is probably the wrong word. They're not getting like five plays per drive. They're having like 16 play drives. So overall, in terms of the amount of plays run in this game, there's going to be a lot. Um, that's going to help when Arizona is getting off the field quicker. That's going to help the Baltimore side. Uh, Mark Ingram, he should be in the red zone a lot. He should be the guy that they want to give the ball to, it seemed, in week one. I like him a good amount. Derrick Henry. So uh, Derrick Henry against Indiana. So overall, you're going to see he was tied for fourth uh, with four red zone touches last week. He's going to be the guy who gets the ball in the red zone. The Colts D looked atrocious last week um, on, on defense against Austin Eckler and the Chargers uh, in terms of the running backs. Uh, $6,000. The only issue here, and he did catch a 75-yard touchdown, but the only issue is his like, overall upside in terms of passing isn't great. And when he's at the exact same price as Mark Ingram, who's also a guy who doesn't have the greatest passing upside, but you're going to be at the same exact price point. And Mark Ingram, more than likely in this matchup, will see more carries and also see more red zone touches. It makes it very hard for me uh, to want to get there. Uh, Mark Ingram ranked second in red zone touches, only behind his teammate, Gus Edwards. Mark Ingram had five, Edwards had seven. Um, and I, again, Ingram probably would have been the guy with seven or eight compared to Gus Edwards if the game didn't completely blow out. Um, so yeah, at the same price point, it's going to be interesting. One of them will garner ownership. I imagine it's Mark Ingram, uh, but they're both very capable with good matchups. So if Mark Ingram gets really over owns, I think getting to Derrick Henry at the same price is going to naturally just give you such low ownership. Tariq Cohen at 4,500. He played on Thursday night, but don't forget that this guy was the primary slot receiver for the, for the Bears. Now, I don't know if Anthony Miller's injury was a reason why Tariq Cohen played in the slot so much, but they made it pretty clear that they're not going to use him as a running back. He had 48 snaps, 46 of them were as a wide receiver, 44 of those were in the slot. Yet Tariq Cohen at 4,500, if you're telling me he's a slot wide receiver this week against Denver, um, give me that all day. He's a mismatch. Uh, he's a mismatch who saw a ton of targets and had a ton of catches out of the slot in week one against a package defense that played really well. Lastly, Devin Singletary is an interest. Keep an eye on Devin Singletary. He ran four times for 70 yards. Um, he had the f second highest explosive run rate only behind Christian McCaffrey on four carries. What is an explosive run? Defined by Pro Football Focus as a run that goes for 10 or more yards. So on every single one of his carries went for 10 or more yards second in the entire league last week on only four carries absolutely insane he got active in the receiving game he was on the field for 70 percent of the snaps, 71.4 percent of the snaps to be exact against um last week against the jets now he gets the giants who were absolutely piss poor last week in all facets again they had no rush defense um i think that this is going to allow josh allen to throw the ball downfield which is worrisome but singletary was on the field way too much um, he's going to make an impact sooner or later. He already made an impact last week, honestly. He had like 93 um, total yardage when you factor in his receiving game work. He's on the field so much that uh, them giving the ball to Frank Gore to close out the game is a little bit worrisome, but somewhat expected. Like put your veteran in there who you got for this situation over your rookie. Um, if Singletary is going to be on the field that much and it's only going to rise at 4,200, it's worth consideration. Um, guys who are in the yellow marks are more GPP options. Like Dalvin Cook, 7,200. Price comes up. Green Bay's defense actually looked good. I'm not sure I need to get there in cash. Clearly okay in GPPs as Minnesota wants to heavily run the ball. Um, only 32 running back carries in week one. Only 10 Kirk Cousins pass attempts. Clearly the pass attempts are going to come up. But those running back carries are going to stay where they are. Keep in mind, though, that you should be owning uh, Alexander Madison in every single league that you have Dalvin Cook. Madison saw nine carries week one. That was 28% of the load. And Madison is going to take on the role of Latavius Murray is what this offense wants to do. Leonard Fournette is a very good GPP play. Uh, the Texans defense is good, but obviously they lost Clowney. Uh, the front has now uh, become much weaker with a loss like that. Even though he's more of a pass rush, he's still somebody who takes pressure off of other people on that team for pass rush responsibilities. And Leonard Fournette had an okay week one, um, 12 and a half fantasy points. Not great by any means, not tournament winning. Okay for cash to not burn you. Um, but yeah, against Houston this week, he's going to be a very good GPP option because he was so heavily owned last week, let a lot of people down, which I imagine makes a lot of people run away from him and try a different flavor this week, which for me, I'd rather go, you know what, he's still in the same situation where only one other touch in the backfield went to Armstrong, the rookie. No other running back saw a touch. Uh, Leonard Fournette saw every single touch except for one in the backfield. So yeah, I'll keep going to Fournette. Marlon Mack, anytime he gets, somebody dropped this stat to me, I looked it up. Anytime he gets over 19 touches, he goes for like 20 plus fantasy points or 22 plus fantasy points. He's too cheap. Um, he had a very good matchup last week. Now he's not going to have that good of a matchup. Tennessee actually shut down 
in week one, uh, Nick Chubb to a good extent. Um, a tough matchup here, but if he's going to get all those touches, Indianapolis run blocking ranked number one week one, overall run the rush offense ranked number one week one. A lot of that has to do with Marlon Mack, but it also takes into account the offensive line. Carry on Johnson, similar to Leonard Fournette, let some people down, but now he gets a very good matchup against the Chargers who just got absolutely blown away by Indianapolis and uh, Marlon Mack in week one. He saw 16 carries last week. I expect him to be somewhere in like the 18 carry range. So seeing 16 in week one doesn't totally shock me, but the game did go to overtime. So some of that was kind of lifted because of that. Aaron Jones, I was not concerned with the snap percentage difference in week one. He had 59% of the snaps. Jamal Williams had 41%. Jamal Williams should have been on the field for 40% of those snaps. If you were watching the game, the Bears were just shot out of cannons. I don't know if they were just sniffing like bath salts before, whatever those salts are that just get you hyped up before you lift because they were just shot out of cannons nonstop. Um, so yeah, having a guy who's a better pass protector in terms of Jamal Williams on the field to not have Aaron Rodgers break his collarbone for the third time against a division rival makes a lot of sense to me. I expect Aaron Jones, though, to be the primary guy this week against Minnesota. Also a pretty good pass rush, nowhere near as good um, as the the Bears. Uh, Matt Breida, somebody to watch for. So Breida is going to probably lose interest for me as the week goes on. There's talk of them um, promoting Jeff Wilson from the, the practice squad, a guy who was pretty efficient last week, last year when he played for a couple games. They have Raheem Morstert in the backfield, who's always been very good and spectacular when he actually gets touches. So now a two-headed monster is back there. Uh, Tevin, Tevin, Jones, Tevin Coleman is going to be out. Uh, so Matt Breed is back there. Uh, San Francisco actually ranked number one in run blocking week one. So that's very good, right? There's going to be opportunities for guys like Brito, who also has a lot of upside in the pass catching game. It's just a matter of if indeed they call up Jeff Wilson, it's a three-headed backfield. If they don't call him up, well, then yeah, Matt Breida is good. And with this matchup against Cincinnati, which Chris Carson just dominated week one, both in the receiving game as a running back and also on the ground, um, it's a very good spot for Matt Breida and Raheem Morstert. They're both GPP viable. Morstert's only 3,800, Breida 5,200, so it's tougher to get to in my opinion, uh, but keep an eye on that situation overall. Josh Jacobs played really well last week. He was an X. He's probably going to go to a Y for me. They gave him 20 plus touches on the ground. He got every single red zone touch for that team uh, on the ground, two touchdowns to account for it. And he is only $4,700. This price point did not reflect quick enough. This is my first time looking at my running back sheet, I believe, since last night's game. Um, so yes, I wanted to see what the actual workload they were going to give Josh Jacobs was. Uh, or uh, um, <clears throat> And it, it looked pretty damn good. And let me get him back up there. Let me get him to being a yes. So yes, cool. Um, let's go to wide receiver now. So wide receiver is a long list. You can see if you were here for the preseason, you know that there's always going to be wow, a lot of people on this list. I'm not going to break down wide receiver too much. We'll focus on that on Patreon and we'll focus if you want to get Patreon, you can get it linked down below. Lots of exclusive content over there. Um, and we'll focus on that on Friday because there's just so much to break down here. But I love Devonte Adams this week, 7,700. He's coming off of a week one stinker where he st- still saw eight targets against arguably, well, last year's number one overall defense. Now he gets to go up against Minnesota where he has just torched Xavier Rhodes almost every single time he's played him in his career. Oh, you want to throw Trey, Way- Trey Waynes on him? Yeah, good luck. This matchup that people are probably going to be scared of this week should not be scared of it. Devontae Adams has absolutely torched these guys. Xavier Rhodes, people are trying to tell me, is still a good quarterback, cornerback. I mean, look at his rankings from last week. Look at his rankings from week or, or all of last season and last week. He did not defend good. Not last week, not all of last season. So no problem getting to Devante, a guy who's going to be low owned because of a bad week one, because of his price point, uh, and also because of people thinking he has a tough matchup this week. So that stands out to me right away. Sammy Watkins clearly stands out. No Tyree Kill this week. Sammy Watkins now against Oakland is going to have, obviously, the best quarterback in the league, throwing him the ball. We saw what he did last week, led everything in, in terms of overall yards after contact, overall um, yards like per route run. He was second only behind um, Hollywood Brown. Obviously, three touchdowns. He went off, right? He went off week one. A lot of people are going to own him. If he comes in just over owned, I'm going to get away from it. I'll go to other pieces of Kansas City that are probably lower owned, like Travis Kelsey, who only caught three balls, only three balls for 88 yards. Um, so yeah, Julian Edelman, Antonio Brown, they're yeses for me, but I really have to see. I'm very curious how the Patriots attack this Miami defense. Like, it's very possible that those guys get going in the first half, but then there's a very good chance that it's the Sony Michelle show, who was an interest of mine, really didn't touch on him. But Sony Michelle's a great play. Gonna have a lot of opportunities in the red zone. He's gonna have a lot of opportunities just in general, where I expect the Patriots to be up big in this game. Tyler Boyd, this is another GPP spot, bounce back spot in a very good matchup against San Francisco. The guy saw 11 targets last week. Um, very good opportunity. Just his teammate, John Ross, decided to go off for 12 targets, two touchdowns, went off, right? Uh, but still very good opportunity there. I love all the Rams receivers, every single one of them. Uh, Brandon Cooks was missed deep once or twice. He had six targets. Robert Woods led the team with 13. Cooper Cup with 10. Like I said, both of them were in the top 10 in wide receiver separation last week. And now they're going to get a very good matchup. Cooper Cup is going to be in the slot against PJ Williams. He's going to devour PJ Williams this week. Allen Robinson, 13 targets last week 
way too cheap in my opinion and that was a bad game for mitch trubisky like 13 targets robinson still goes over 100 yards and a bad game for trubisky second year removed from his acl injury i'm very excited to see what Allen robinson can do michael gallup uh, played very well week one had like 150 something yards a 60 yard catch at one point i uh, did not get in the end zone one of the only guys on that team now two five different receivers got in the end zone um but yeah overall or four different receivers overall michael gallup looked good now he's gonna go up against washington who i've imagined a lot of the attention from landon collins josh norman only stays on one side of the field so they can kind of pick where they want to put him mari cooper they don't have to kind of have a shadow treatment from norman uh, so decent depending on which side they actually line him up on uh if he does not see as much norman it'll be good i imagine they try and get uh amari cooper away from norman though dd westbrook saw the most targets from gardner minshaw once he came in 24 percent target share i believe he saw six targets and then you had or five targets from minshaw six overall i believe in that game uh, so dd would be the guy that i get to there but i'm not sure i actually want to get to a uh, dd westbrook with gardner minshaw as your quarterback when i can pick any other guys and he's 5400 john brown 5200 is a very big interest of mine i already talked about my interest in josh allen again there's going to be no pressure on josh allen the guy who's going to be able to scramble get rushing yards but also have time to throw deep to josh brown who absolutely went off week one i uh, led the team in targets one target more i believe than cole beasley he had 123 yards receiving on seven catches and a touchdown and i only expect it to get better week two against the giants who just have nothing really to put in the way of getting to josh allen nothing really in terms of trying to cover john brown then there's a lot of interest right um i do think that uh, adam humphreys is interesting this week he didn't do anything week one but i do think he's interesting because the colts really are going to funnel to the middle of the field into running backs um so you don't have a pass catching running back in derrick henry but you do have a tight end in delaney walker and you do have who the colts gave up the most receiving yards to tight ends last week or last year then they gave up 60 receiving yards to hunter henry last week uh, i believe on like six catches so good game for a tight end now you have delaney walker in the middle of the field who had a good game last week led the team in targets and also you're gonna have adam humphreys who didn't have a good game but he's gonna kind of take on nowhere near the same as um skill set as keenan allen not even close uh, but he is a guy who will run the short to intermediate routes and get those funneled type targets uh, from marcus Mariota against the colts team that wants to funnel it to slot receivers tight ends and running backs so he's an interesting like gpp play adam humphreys uh, it's just really tough to see me getting there because he just didn't get the looks week one Tyrell Williams is 4,400. He caught a touchdown, had over 100 yards last um, last night, actually. Uh, he looked fine. 4,400, he probably moves into a yes for me as the week goes on. I wanted to see how he can perform as a number one receiver. He performed well. Now he gets probably an even better matchup than his matchup against Denver last night against Kansas City this upcoming week. Larry Fitz played well. Tough matchup against Baltimore, but he'll still get peppered with targets. McCole Hardman for Kansas City. Once Tyreek went down, Hardman did nothing, like, at all. But Hardman should be the guy, the second-round rookie, who was electric in um, camp. He had an electric touchdown in the preseason. Looked really good overall. Now he gets a very good matchup. He's 4,800. He can very easily take the role as the number three guy on this team, right? You have Travis Kelsey, Sammy Watkins, and then mccall hardman but he could also drop to like the number four guy or five depending on damian williams looks depending on what else they do at wide receiver so hardman the rookie stands out but as of right now we have to see who actually gets the start there lots of other guys stand out chris conley had a good rapport with gardner Minshaw. had like four targets in the time he was in there anthony miller is a sneaky guy at only forty one hundred dollars he was not fully healthy against the packers so like his one target against the packers was on limited snaps he was injured he should be more healthy this week i'm surprised he even played last week forty one hundred dollars is a sneaky sneaky play for tournaments i love it actually uh, danny amendola had a lot of looks but now he has a very tough matchup against the chargers and lots of guys are down here. Debo Samuel, I like that against the Bengals. 88% of the um, snaps at wide receiver position. He's eventually going to end up doing something well. You have, uh, with that amount of opportunity, with a good quarterback, you have Terry McLaurin, who had a very good game week one. Now he has a tougher matchup against Dallas overall, but he's only 3,800. Price doesn't really come up enough. Deion Kane is interesting, and so is um, and so is Paris Campbell. So you had week one, Devin Funches go down. Well, I imagine now Paris Campbell or Deion Kane is going to get the start opposite of T.Y. Hilton on the outside uh Deion kane fantastic in camp paris campbell the rookie that they're very high on keep an eye on who's going to slide into the starting position here as the week goes on if we get any notes that'll probably be the guy who has more snaps than the other guy clearly uh, and also has a lot of opportunity Deion kane is flat minimum of three thousand dollars and then paris campbell's only 3700 so lots of wide receivers below four thousand you also have danny amendola who saw 13 targets 11 in regulation because that one went to overtime so yeah keep an eye on all that tons of wide receivers i'll be shrinking down the pool but right now john brown stands out Allen Robinson stands out at his point. I have interest in Devontae Adams, every single one of the Rams wide receivers. And then sort of on the cheaper end, Anthony Miller's a very sneaky play this week, in my opinion, with upside. And whoever fills in, McCole Hardman as well, um, and whoever fills in for uh, Devin Funches on Indianapolis. Tight end's a very fun spot this week. 
Travis Kelsey, I imagine, is going to be very low-owned just because he's 7,300 and he did not ball out last week. Travis Kelsey might have had the worst game of his season last week. Three catches, 88 yards. If that's the worst game of his season, that's going to be the best game of a lot of tight end seasons this week. Uh, it's just expensive. It's hard to get to him. But if he can, he's a very good GPP play and a fantastic matchup um, against Oakland. Uh, George Kittle, same can be said, a fantastic matchup against the Bengals. He had a lot of opportunities, 10 targets last week, eight catches for 54 yards. Again, I don't think he becomes that highly owned because there's a lot of very good cheap tight ends this week, and there's no reason to pay up unless you want to kind of get exposure to guys who have a 30-point possibility in their outcomes. Evan Ingram at 5,200 is another reason why people probably don't get up because Evan Ingram balled out last week, 14 targets, caught like 10 of them, had over 100 yards and a touchdown. He ran a route on 82% of Eli Manning's uh, dropbacks. That's very good for a tight end overall. Um, it's a much tougher opponent now against Buffalo. Very, very tough compared to Dallas Buffalo. Um, last year, at least, was the best in the league at defending the tight end position. So uh, I probably don't get to Evan Ingram, but it's interesting. Mark Andrews, so he was fifth overall in fantasy points per snap. He was number one in tight ends. That number usually goes to wide receivers and running backs, normally running backs. He was number one in yards run uh, per route. Uh, or yards per route ran, which is a PFF stat that is very predictive of your overall efficiency as a player for fantasy. That was number one for tight ends, but he only ran a route on 64% of Lamar Jackson's dropbacks. So last week he was only on the field, or last year he was only on the field for like 50% of the snaps. Uh, now he's only running a route on around 60% of the snaps. So he still played very well. It's just he's being so, so efficient, like Russell Wilson last year at the quarterback position. He's being so, so efficient overall and that's kind of clear in his number one in yards per route run number five in fantasy points per touch number one in both of those categories for tight ends um he still looks good he has a very good matchup against arizona there's no reason to want to like really say anything bad about him at 3800 i just still think that if he's only running around on 60 percent of the snaps and you have guys lower than him running routes on 70 to 80 to 90 percent of the snaps why would i not get to those guys i understand the big week one but he's not going to keep up that level of efficiency and he does not have as near the amount of opportunity as these other guys uh, so Jimmy Graham, Green Bay targeted tight ends on 10 of Aaron Rodgers' 30 attempts. Six of those went to Jimmy Graham, two in the red zone, one for a touchdown. They said that they want to target the tight ends more in this offense. They did it in week one. If that's the case, $3,700 is a good price. Delaney Walker I talked about. He had a team leading six targets last week. He was third in fantasy points per snap overall, not even just for the tight ends. Third in fantasy points per snap um, overall. So actually, Mark Andrews, when I said he was number one in that category, he was number five overall, number two in tight ends. Delaney Walker now gets the ideal matchup against Indy. They gave up six catches for 60 yards to Hunter Henry last week um they gave up the most yards to the tight end the year before they just want to um funnel to tight ends to slot receivers like i said into running backs there's no real running back on this team to catch the ball with derrick henry Deion lewis will be on the field a little bit but not too much um compared to derrick henry uh, and then you have adam humphreys and delaney walker in the middle of the field walker is by far the favorite target of um marcus Mariota since he's been in this league tj hawkinson balled out he ran around on 73 percent of Matthew Stafford's dropbacks. He had all the hype in the world coming out being called Mini Gronk. He had nine targets, six catches, 131 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, the best tight end debut ever, uh, apparently. 12th best overall, not even just for a debut, but 12th best ever for a tight end in a game. So he looked really well. 73% of the routes um, run is really good. Darren Waller, the guy from Baltimore drafted a couple of years back, um, seven catches, 70 yards on Monday Night Football. He played every single snap, 100% of the snaps. He led the team in eight targets. Now he gets a matchup against Kansas City, who last year was around the middle of the pack, if not a little bit better defending the tight end. But it's still going to be a spot where uh, Tyra Williams is going to have to be accounted for on the outside. They'll probably key in a little bit on the run. Darren Waller is going to run a ton. Again, 100% of the snaps. It's hard to get away from that at 3,300. Look, there's so many good tight end options down low. Delaney Walker in a really good spot for 3,500. Uh, and again, the favorite target of Mariota in a, off, uh, in, a, again, in a matchup that the defense is going to funnel to him. TJ Hawkinson's $3,000 in a very tough matchup for wide receivers, but not so much um, for, for tight ends. And again, targeted nine times last week, team leading 73% of the time he ran a route. Uh, 3000 $3,300 for Darren Waller. These guys are all so, so cheap. Another guy I'll point out is Hunter Henry. Price comes up to 4300 He ran, he played 92% of snaps, ran a route on 82% of them. So, I mean, he was just acting as a wide receiver pretty much the, for the majority of the game, right? The only issue there is Hunter Henry's price comes up to $4,300, $400 more, and you have guys that are $1,000 plus cheaper or right around there in Walker, Hawkinson, and Waller. Uh, Walker and Waller sound very similar, uh, but those three guys who I believe are have just as much upside, if not more, for their price. I do think Hunter Henry sees a lot lower ownership this week, which would be wrong in my opinion. So if his ownership comes in lower than those guys, He's, he's on the field a ton, 92% of the snaps. He ran a route the most out of TJ Hawkinson, out of Delaney Walker, out of Waller at 82%. I believe that I have to see Waller's stats. They didn't come in from last night yet, but 82%. So he's going to have opportunity, right? He caught six balls for 60 yards. Like if he falls in the end zone, he's going to have way higher ownership, a way higher price point than any of those guys. So 
these are all my interests. There's so many tight end options. That's why I do believe Travis Kelsey and George Kittle are the good GPP options because they're just going to go under owned for their upside. I get away from Evan Ingram and all the hype in a very tough matchup this week. I get away from Mark Andrews and all the hype, even though he has a good matchup, even though I think he's actually going to be better than I thought this year, still only ran around on 64% of the uh, quarterback dropbacks, and he caught his touchdown from Robert Griffin the third, not Lamar Jackson, as people will probably wrongfully assume so. Um, so yeah, tight end's a very fun position this week. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how you get uh, to where you get because you don't have to punt. There's just so many good options that are cheap. So that's it for right now. This is the early week breakdown position by position. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. If this is your first time seeing me and you had um, got any value from this, which I assume you probably did, hit the subscribe button. Let's get to 8,000. Um, before tomorrow. We're at like 7,800. I appreciate you all so much. Check out my Patreon for exclusive content. Follow me on Twitter at DFS. I'll be live Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday at 11 a.m. on Awesomeo's channel with Lofi and Chris Randone on Saturday. So peace out, gang. Hey, hey, hold up, hold up, hold up. One second. Check out this page. If you haven't yet subscribed, hit the subscribe button, all right? And if you're interested in Patreon, if you're not already a patron, you can hit that button on Patreon, become a patron. It will take you right there. You can also check me out on Twitter at Salvetri. DFS. And hey, if you're interested, this next video that's about to pop up, why don't you check it out as well? See ya.